We're here with Tanya Vyofsky, who's won her part in the three seat primary for Chittenden Central Senate District, which is a new district this year. And so we'll be seeing some changes. So currently you represent Essex Town in the, um, in the House. What made you decide to leave that and run for the Senate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I do represent what was formerly the Chittenden 8-1 district and is now the Chittenden 23 district, which is a bit of a hybrid district between the town and the city. Um, I certainly didn't go in with a plan. That's not really how I do things, you know, laying out the next 10 or 15 years. What it really, you know, as the Senate districts shaped up and there were just such a rush, like mass retirements in the Senate. Um, connecting with my mentors and with people in the community about you know what I envisioned for a political future it, it became apparent that with that many openings and some key people um, that I really align with and look up to leaving the Senate that it was an opportune time if I ever wanted to be in the Senate to, to run for the Senate you know what we know is that those seats aren't open very often right. people tend to get in and kind of hold on to them so with two open seats in the district it seemed like it was a good time to do it so how do you plan to reach voters in other parts of your new district that you didn't currently represent like if you were staying in the house i would be in your district mm -hmm. now and sorry i'm not um in that little piece of old colchester road that got pushed Mm. into the town in the new house district. Um, but I imagine there, there are a lot of people, Burlington, Winooski, mm -hmm. and so on, that are in your new Senate district that don't know you. How do you plan to reach that? Yeah, absolutely. So during the primary, we actually spent a lot of time and focus trying to reach those new voters within the larger Senate district in Winooski and Burlington. You know, certainly not leaving behind our, our Essex voters, but people in Essex know who I am and, and you know I've represented them for the past couple of years so we we did spend a lot of focus um, knocking doors in Burlington and Winooski doing events in Burlington and Winooski doing literature drops really trying to connect with with those new voters and we will continue to do that in the general election I anticipate doing some town hall style events and continuing to to call and, and connect with people I do think um, because of my placement on the Government Operations Committee in the last biennium, I did have some name recognition in Burlington and Winooski due to their charter changes that came through the committee. Um, every charter change in Vermont comes through the Government Operations right. Committee and Burlington had five of them, Winooski had two, so that I think um, gave me some name recognition in those areas because I'd already worked on Winooski and Burlington issues, um, but again, it is really a, a focus on, on grassroots organizing and just trying to connect with as many people as possible. How do you plan to approach November with the knowledge that the primary was really the one that mattered? Yeah, we certainly went in knowing that the primary was kind of the bigger race, which is hard because primaries are so compact and so intense. Um, the general election, though, for me is an opportunity to continue making those connections and really focus on sort of issues-based organizing and connecting with people. I don't know that we need to put the same level of intensity, although in a general, it's just more spread out and people tend to be paying closer attention anyway, so it makes it a little bit easier to connect with people. But I will really use a lot of the same tools that I have always used, You know, as I said, some town hall, issues-based town hall events, um, making sure that I'm obviously at the debates that are happening and um, continuing some door knocking, phone calls. We will also likely focus some of our energy and attention on lower turnout voters, lower income voters, students, young people, the people who oftentimes don't show up to elections to really provide voter registration opportunities and education around why elections are so important. While you were in the house this last biennium, was there a bill that meant a lot to you that did not pass? And do you hope to revisit that in the Senate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there were a couple of bills that meant a lot. The one that I um, am really 
planning to work on quite a bit is a police oversight bill. It sets up municipal citizen oversight. Um, I really feel like, you know, with all of the conversation right now about what is happening within policing, getting eyes in to really get a sense of what is going on and, and really taking the policing of police out of the hands of police, because right now it's sort of really insular. So that is a bill that I have, um, that I introduced in the House and I've been working on with some members of the police force, with members of various community groups to really try to fine tune. So the bill I introduced in the Senate won't be exactly the same because I think we've strengthened it and really brought more people on board. So um, it would be a community, like the planning commission and yeah, Something kind of like, like that. kind of like that. Yeah, it would stand up a committee of citizens that appointed by. Um, that is a piece that we're still sort of discussing what might make the most sense. Um, we initially had had it appointed from the legislature, um, but it may not make sense to do it that way. Like I said, the bill I introduced two years ago will not be exactly the same. The idea will be there, but I've done a significant work since then trying to really strengthen that. Another um, bill that I really want to work on, but I may end up leaving in the House, is a property tax reform bill. It would take our education spent funding out of the property tax and instead establish an income-based education tax, which would hopefully lower the burden on some of our lower income and mid middle income Vermonters to paying into the education system. Um, I do have a commitment um, from people in the House on the Ways and Means Committee to try to move that next year. So I may introduce a companion in the Senate, but I also may just leave that in the House because it sounds like there's some energy to work on that there. Although I did have a discussion um, yesterday with Senator Baruth, and he also has some interest in, in taking that forward. So I'm not quite sure where that'll land. Um, a lot of times I think when there is energy on both sides, it can be helpful to have a bill in the House and a bill in the Senate that way, who has, wherever there is really that energy and time, it can take off. Any other things that you hope to accomplish? Yeah, some of the other things that I am hoping to work on um, is setting some universal civic standards for our K-12 um, students. I don't know that that'll be a bill that I will introduce in this biennium. I think it's probably more of a five-year plan to work towards that, but I know um, Senator McCormick is really invested in that and has worked on it for some time and I've been working with a national organization called Civics Now to try and lay out how we how we do that in a state like Vermont where local control is so important to set a standard but allow each lo uh, municipality and, and locality to figure out how they're going to meet it. Um, so that is something that I am hoping to work on and it may not constitute an immediate bill um, but I, I do want to to move forward with that. I'm also looking at ways to continue to make voting accessible. Um, and one of the things that I was able to include in our voting expansion bill, I think that was two years ago, um, although the biennium blurs together a little bit, um, was a feasibility study for universal mail balloting in the primaries. So I'm really interested to hear what the Secretary of State brings back and, and think about how and if that can be implemented. I know that, that one sounds like it might be a little difficult with the separate ballots. And that was the Secretary of State's concern as well. Um, one of the things that, one of the other things that I was able to strengthen and make sure was included in that bill was a ballot curing provision. Um, so if people forget to return two of their ballots or accidentally vote on two ballots, the town clerks can reach out and give them the opportunity to cure that mistake. Um, and we did see it really widely used actually in this past primary with a less than 1% um, reje rejection rate after people were able to cure it. It was higher, but many people took advantage of the abil ability to fix that. So that's part of why the Secretary of State was initially pretty resistant to moving forward with, with primary mail balloting, but was open to that feasibility study. So we'll have to kind of see what they tell us and kind of look at some of the changes that we've made. But I do know that a lot of people during this primary were really confused. Why aren't I getting my ballot? Or, you know, I heard from a lot of people, well, I'm just waiting for my ballot to come. And, you know, so it was a lot of education around that's not going to happen. And so I think people it just, it's confusing in my view to it have is. it universal mail for the general, but not the primary. And I know some municipalities are, have moved to universal mail. So I think the more we can streamline, the less confusing it'll be. It was even confusing on election day to just go and see them all. Yes. If we're doing universal <coughs> mail balloting, it should be universal. Right. Um, so that is something that I'm really and hoping. And as streamlined as possible. Exactly. Yeah. So that's something I'm hoping to work on with the Secretary of State. And then a bill that, a lead sponsored bill that I passed 
um, around mental health licensure um, had a workforce development task force in it. And so we will be seeing that report back from the Office of Professional Regulation. And I, I would hope to take action on really growing that. I work as a clinical social worker when I'm not in the legislature and the mental health system is in absolute disarray. And I don't think there's going to be one easy fix. It's the reality is, is that's a system that's been under invested in for 50 years. Right. So I think it's gonna be a multifaceted fix that unfortunately takes time that a lot of people don't have, yeah. um, but I am really looking forward yeah, to seeing you're when we Yeah, crisis back. and there's a wait to yeah. get into treatment, it really It's not good. No. It's not good, and it, it, it impacts so many aspects of life. It impacts the life for that individual, but it impacts neighborhoods and communities, and, and so I think it's critically important that we make those investments, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to taking action and moving forward on that as well. In debates and things I've read about you. Um, you came from a more working class background. How do you see that as beneficial to you in representing those people? And how do you see the differences in, in viewpoints when you're in the legislature with people who may not have the same background. Yeah, my experience in the legislature is that there are very few people who have that background that are in those spaces. And what I think that allows to happen is a lot of the issues impacting working class Vermonters get intellectualized and we're not thinking about the real human impact of the policies that we're making or in many instances not making. And so I think that my experience of growing up in a work, you know, single parent working class home really allows me to speak to what the real impacts are. I, you know, gave a floor speech when we were talking about universal school meals that came directly from my own experience of being ashamed to be on free and reduced lunch and skipping lunch and getting a job and not being able to participate in extracurricular activities because of the shame associated with that. And, you know, I think a lot of people in the legislature could speak to why they felt like it might be the right thing to do, but I was the only one that stood up and said, here's my actual experience. Um, and I think that that's important. Our legislature is not set up to be terribly accessible to working class people, and so I think that's part of why it skews, you know, to away from time. that. And representation matters, you know? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, I, as, as I said before we, we opened, I'm not someone who ever saw myself in the political world. That was certainly, I didn't have people like me with my experience that I could look up to and it certainly didn't see, seem to me as a viable path forward. I sort of stumbled into it and I think that that has led me to, you know, I don't have the next 10 years of my political future planned out. I don't really know exactly where I will be politically um, in 10 years. Right now, my focus is on the general election and then we'll be on representing my district. And, and as things move and shift, we'll see what happens. I'm not, I know so many people get into this and they've got like the 10 year plan. I'm gonna be, you know, yeah. in Congress or I'm gonna be here. That's just not how I approach this. Or at least, you know, have like an outline of what you wanna be doing later on. Yeah, but I think, a lot of the people, again, just due to the nature of our structure, kind of always knew they were going to be in politics. I hear that a lot from people in the legislature, that that was sort of always the plan, and that's just not true for me. Um, who's your hero? Politically or in general? In general, <laughs> living or dead. Um, oh, I don't know that. The first person that really comes to mind, honestly, is my dad. It's not a famous person. It's not a person that everyone knows, but my dad taught me to always question things and to challenge things that seemed wrong. And he taught me to think critically and deeply and really dig into the why of things. And it was interesting. I think it was last summer I was, he attended, an, virtually, because he lives in Kansas, but he attended an event that I was at and afterwards called and he just told me how proud he was of me and was like, how did you, how did you become like this? I was like, you. Because not only did he teach me to think that way, but he supported it even when I challenged him, even when I questioned what he was doing. And I think that really, I don't know. So the, the first, like I said, the first person that comes to mind as my hero is my dad. I'd like to thank you, Tanya, for being here with us with the Essex Retorter and good luck in the general. 
Thank you. It's nice to be here and get to, to hear what's on your mind. This is Heidi Clark with the Essex Reach Order, and we're interviewing candidates ahead of the November election. In Chittenden Central, we have just spoken with Tanya Vyofsky. We will soon be speaking with Martine Larocque Gulick. And unfortunately, Senator Phil Baruth has declined to be interviewed. 